Hello and welcome to this new series on app development and Python for the digital humanities or anyone who is interested. In this series, we're going to be dealing with Streamlit, which is a fairly new past two years uh, framework for working with app development and Python. It's really useful. I use it in a lot of my projects. I'm in no way being sponsored by them to do this video series, but I thought it'd be really good to share with the community because Streamlit can do a lot of rapid prototyping for digital humanities based apps. You can do these in a matter of an hour, maybe two or three if you're doing something really complex, but you can have something that can be distributed out to your community for beta testing within a day. And this is why I think Streamlit is particularly really useful to uh, like digital humanists. It allows for you to get tools up and running within a matter of 24 hours. So throughout this video series, we're going to be solving a couple different uh, common DH problems in Python with Streamlit for app development. We're going to be working with how to deploy databases, explore those databases in Streamlit. We're going to be talking about data visualization, how to visualize and map data dynamically through Streamlit with data that might be loaded in the back end or on Google Docs. And then we're also going to be working with other things like how to actually get natural language processing models up and running so that your community can use your custom NLP framework such as Spacey on a Streamlit app in the cloud. We're also going to be talking about how to do some custom machine learning models that can be trained in a Streamlit framework. We're also going to finally be doing something like image classification for de deploying an image classifier in the cloud so that your community can start using their data and using it with your model. That's all going to be covered in several parts of this series. In this video, though, we're going to be talking about introduction to Streamlit. I'm going to go through how to install it, how to get an app up and running, and I'm also going to be giving you in 30 minutes or so all of Streamlit's basic features so that you'll know how to get an app up and running after the end of this video on your own. What's nice about Streamlit, as we're going to see, is that it can be hosted locally or through Streamlit Share. And that's going to be under uh, the sharing tab up here. You click that and you can request an invite. You're going to have to provide them with your GitHub username so that they can link up to your GitHub and allow for you to quickly share an app. In a later video, I'm going to show you how to start deploying models and deploying apps through the Streamlit sharing. For right now, though, go ahead and hit request. In a couple weeks, you're going to learn why that's important. So how do you install it? Well, you install it like any other Python library. I'm using Streamlit 8.84 uh, at the time of this recording. Uh, I like 0.84. It's got a couple new features that weren't present uh, with earlier versions, such as the ability for to create forms, which we're not going to get to in this video, but we will get to in a later video, and to do uh, something with states, which allows for you to make more robust and sophisticated apps. I am going to be updating the GitHub repository as Streamlit kind of progresses, and I'll try to keep it up to date. So if you want to see an updated version of the code, keep a lookout on the GitHub repo, which will be linked in the description down below. And finally, all of these apps that we make in this series, I'm going to be hosting on Streamlit Share so that you can use them. Again, I'll provide that link in the description down below. And that's thanks to Streamlit's team who has graciously allowed me to have more than the, um, the maximum three app limit to do this series. Again, not being paid, and no way is they, are they sponsoring this video, just something I'm really happy with, um, a product that I'm happy with and happy to be talking about. So the way in which you're going to install Streamlit is you're going to do pip install Streamlit. Fairly straightforward, typical library as you can tell. Uh, I already have installed it, so I have all of these uh, dependencies already installed as well. And once you have it pip installed, you can start now working with Streamlit. Now, I'm going to be working in my base environment. Uh, as we kind of go forward, I'll put in the requests.txt file all the different uh, versions of pandas and things like that that we're going to be working in, working with throughout the series. But for this video, we're not really interested in all these robust libraries. Instead, what we're going to be interested in is just getting working with Streamlit itself, getting some basic app up and running and going through the docs and the basic features of it, things like how to input data, how to get uh, write data on this onto the app, how to create a title, how to create special buttons that do certain things, how to get checkboxes. We're going to go through all those main basic components in about 30 minutes or so in this video series. So if this sounds interesting to you, stick around and let's get to it. And I'd also like to take this moment to thank all my Patreon supporters. If uh, you haven't done so already and you get a lot out of this uh, this entire channel, please do consider supporting it via Patreon. A link for that is in the description down below. It allows me to keep making this content free for everyone so that those of all economic backgrounds can benefit from these lessons. 
So what can Streamlit do for you? Well, here's an example of an app that we're going to be working on in part three of this series when we use Streamlit to do something like data visualization, specifically for network analysis. This data set is going to be what we call the Burton Von Nama Edwards data set for Carol Engine manuscripts that I've taken as a Word document, modified a whole bunch and created a whole bunch and created some structured data with it. Essentially, it allows for us to map out a textual network between different people who wrote what we call scriptural commentaries. If you don't read Latin, if you don't care about medieval history, if you don't care about manuscripts, that's perfectly fine. What you might care about is being able to use Streamlit to do some pretty powerful things. Here on the left hand side, we're going to see this in a later video, we have something called a form and we also have checkboxes. What we can do is we can map out all of the data in a database which I have also loaded as a CSV file and read in all that information and based on the parameters over here on the left create a PyViz network graph. If you notice up here the link for this is in the description down below this is already deployed in the cloud and what you're seeing is real time the deployment of a actual useful app for network visualization. If we zoom in, because we're using PyViz, we can see PyViz, uh, the output of PyViz, all loaded here dynamically on the page. We can change the parameters over here on the left, and we can look at this textual network with more or fewer features. The more features, the longer it's going to take to load because the more data is present. We also have a nice drop-down menu, which is a relatively newer feature from, uh, I think it's 0.84 or an er a slightly earlier version that allows for us to go through and read the data as it appears in the CSV file. It's a little clunky because that's on me. I haven't made this perfect yet. Part three is still in development, but you can get a sense here quickly how you can do a lot of really powerful things. And this app only will take about an hour if you know what you're doing to actually create, maybe another 30 minutes to, to perfect and debug. My point is you can rapidly deploy your ideas for the larger community through not only the Streamlit framework, but also through their share.streamlit service. Again, that sharing is free. You can have up to three apps and that's fantastic. For this series, we're going to be recording with our code and Adam on the left-hand side of the screen, and we're going to be opening up a browser on the right-hand side. You'll see why in just a second. On the right-hand side, we're going to be looking at the Streamlit app in real time. I'm going to explain why that's important in just a moment. Let's go ahead and just try to make, right off the bat, our first app. How do we do that? Well, we're going to import Streamlit as ST, and we're going to save this, it helps, as app.py. And that's kind of the standard. You can save this as anything that you want, so long as it has a unique name and it's a Python file. And you're going to import Streamlit as ST. That's the Pythonic way to do it, which means that's how it's represented in the docs. And that's how everyone in the community imports Streamlit. Once you have uh, Streamlit imported, let's just go ahead and make a simple write. We're going to say, this is my new app. And if you notice, I have done this by saying st.write. And that's all I'm going to do for this app at this moment. We're going to add to it throughout this video as we learn all the different features. But the big question is, how do you go ahead and run the app? Let's go ahead and take a look at that right now. So what I can do is I can open up my directory where the app is currently sitting. And if you're using Windows, this will work. You can open up right here the command prompt so that you're already in the right directory. From this directory, you're going to run streamlet, or you're going to say streamlet run app.py, in this case the name of the file, as you can see right there. When you execute that command, you'll be noticing that it's going to take just a second or two to actually run, but what it's doing is it's loading up a local host server. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow you to see your app change in real time. So let's move these two things out of the way to the other screen, and let's bring over our handy dandy browser. And as you can see, I've got now my app on the right hand side loaded up in the browser. So we can see that this code produced this app. What's cool about Streamlit, and this is what makes it really powerful, is it's constantly rerunning the script. So it's uh, at least kind of dynamically reloading for you. So as you make changes, you don't have to rerun your app. You can just simply refresh your app or click over here and click rerun. We'll talk about some of these other features in a, in a later video or so. Uh, your screen might not look black. You can change your settings and you can actually have a different theme selected. For me, I am using just the, the darker version because I think that looks cooler. Uh, but for you, you might use the white version that's, that comes standard or the, the light version. Do whatever you like. For now, we need to give our app a title. Let's just call this app. When I say st.title, let's call this uh, Streamlit 
tutorial app. And now you'll notice when I save this app or the, the Python file, over here it has told me source file changed. That means that something has changed. Streamlit has noticed that something has changed in the source file, our app.py, and we need to rerun it. If we hit rerun, we see that we have not had to rewrite out streamlit run app.py. We have it dynamically or just reload it for us automatically. So this is what makes streamlit really easy to prototype in. You can generate an app fairly quickly right out of the gate. But apps need to do more than just simply say information. They need to allow users to do a specific task. In app development, tasks are done and manipulated by a front end interface. So what we're going to do now is go through some of the front end interfaces that are available to you through Streamlit natively, meaning you don't have to do a lot of custom HTML work to get a really useful and kind of beneficial app up and running right away. So let's take a look at the different front end features. So the most common front end feature that you're going to have in any app is going to be a button, a button that you press or the user presses and it does a specific thing. In this series or this video, we're just going to be doing some basic things here. To create a button, let's call this button one. We're going to make that equal to st.button and then we need to pass in a few arguments here. What we need to uh, do is, is give this button essentially a label. So we're going to call this uh, click me and that'll be it. So now when we save this, we're going to notice that we've got a button, but this button doesn't do anything. And noticeably, I want to draw attention to one thing right now. Each time you click this button, keep in mind Streamlit is constantly kind of refreshing in the back end. It's going to just constantly rerun for you on the back end. So if you click the button after you've loaded some data that's supposed to be read, you're going to have a bit of a problem. To load data with a button that kind of reads the data, that the user inputs all of it, and then does an action, it's easier to use something that they have officially implemented in a previous or slightly earlier version than 0.84. That's it. That's a form. And I'm going to talk about forms in an entirely separate video because they need their own entire video because there's a lot you can do with them. They make your app go from being kind of clunky to being very, very useful and very clean very quickly. But for right now, we're just going to worry about what buttons do. So as you can imagine, you can click a button, but we need that button to trigger some kind of action. There's a few different things that you can do. You can use buttons to call functions. We're going to get into that in a later video, but you can also say that if a button is clicked, something needs to occur in the app. So let's say we need to say if uh, button, so if button is going to be essentially true, then what we need to do is we need something to happen. We need to say st.write, let's say this is some text. So when you click the button, that something's going to happen and it's going to print something off. So oh, it helps if you actually call your object the right thing. Let's go ahead and rerun that. So if I click this button, something needs to happen and I click it and it says this is some text. So we've used the button and remember the button is going to store a state that is a boolean, which means it's going to be true or false. By clicking this button, we're able to display something now on the screen. So if the button is clicked is what this is saying. If it's true, then perform this action. If you are using a lot of data from user input, you're going to want to do all of this inside of a form. Again, I can't emphasize that enough. If you try to pass a lot of parameters here, you're going to run into some problems. A form is the right way to go. We're going to see that in probably the next video. So that's how a button kind of works. But a app needs to have a lot more features than just a single button that does one, one simple thing. Users oftentimes need to input extra data. That can be a couple different things. Let's go ahead and look at some of the different ways we can input or give users the ability to input data. One of the simpler ways to, to give users the ability to input data is through what we call checkboxes. Checkboxes are things that are going to be true or false. These are booleans. That's how the state is going to be stored as a variable in Python. And that's important to know. So let's go ahead and try to create a very simple, very rudimentary checkbox. We're going to call this checkbox um, like. So this is going to be a checkbox that you can check if you like something. So we're just simply going to say st.checkbox. And we're going to pass in again a single argument here. This is going to be the label. This is going to be the question, do you like this app? And hopefully, if you have a nice user base, they're going to say yes. So let's go ahead, save that, and rerun it. Again, you notice that our uh, right, uh, this is some text has gone away because we haven't clicked the button. If we click the button, we see that it comes back. So we can now interact with this new feature, this checkbox right here. So do you like this app? However, 
nothing's really happening, and there's a reason for this. We haven't called this checkbox. In order to call the checkbox, we need to have a way to uh, look at it, see if it's true or false, and if it is one or the other, we are going to then generate a response. So what we need to do is we need to create a new button. So let's go through and do that. We're going to call this button2. That's going to be equal to st.button, just like we saw ab above. And we're going to just call this a submit button. What this submit button is going to do is it's going to check and see if like is selected. So just like before, we need to trigger something when the button is clicked. So if button 2, if button 2 is clicked, in other words, we need to go and see if like is selected. Now let's go ahead and see what like looks like. We're going to do st.write like. So let's just save that and rerun it. And we're going to unselect it and we're going to hit that. Now what we have done is we've printed off what that object is. Notice that it's returning false. If we select it, it's going to return true. We're able to see what that object is now. But we oftentimes use that data to generate a response. So instead of saying something like just write out what the object is, we can say, we can create a condition if like, so if like is equal to true, uh, then we want it to do is we want it to say write, thanks, I like it too. Wonderful, that's very optimistic. So now we can save that, rerun it, and when we click that, it's now used that condition, that boolean, to allow us to leverage it in this conditional. So if that is positive, if it is a like, then we are going to have that response. We can also say else, so if it's not a like, st.write, we can say, I'm sorry, you have bad tastes. <laughs> um, so that's wonderful. We can be a little snarky with our audience as well, which everyone should be. Uh, so we can say uh, this now, uncheck it, and now we've officially insulted our user base with a relatively mean app. Um, so this is how you can use a checkbox to do something uh, like store a variable that the user will input. What's nice about the checkbox, as you might imagine, like any other app, is that you can really control what that user input is. It means that uh, a user, this is, this is a true false statement. Do you like this app? It's only a yes or no. You either check it or you don't. And that's gonna be how you kind of use a checkbox. So you control a user input to get a true or false statement or a Boolean. Now you can do this to do a lot more things as you might already be imagining. But there's other ways that you can take user input data. Let's go ahead and explore some of those right now. So another common uh, app feature uh, for interaction with a user is going to be something that we call a radio button. You might already be familiar with these. So let's go ahead and just kind of use these right down here. And in fact, let's go ahead and just uh, do this. So we can make the code a little easier to read for you all. So we're going to keep it kind of in the center. So we're going to create a new thing. So we're going to say st write uh, start of the radio button section. So we're going to have that. So we can kind of rerun this and see that, okay, we're starting uh, all this right now. But you know what? This is looking a little clunky. We've got a lot of things that are just ST right. And so what's separating this text from this text from this text? Well, fortunately, we have a couple different ways to kind of generate some header data. We can use ST.header or we can input our own markdown. I'm not gonna talk about that right now, but we can control a markdown feature, which gives you a few more options to play with than the ST header, but you can control what your app looks like and how it's structured with these nice little headers. And so we can go ahead and uh, start of the uh, checkbox section. Checkbox section. And we can make our app look a little cleaner really quickly uh, and so we can kind of see these different sections kind of being laid out. I'm going to get into uh, how to structure the layout of your app, meaning sidebars, columns, things like this, in a later video when I talk about how to customize your layout of the app. Let's go ahead and keep on going down now with different ways to get user input data. So we're going to work with right now a radio button. So uh, let's, let's presume that our users are going to tell us their favorite animal. So we're gonna call this animal. And what we're looking for is we're looking for a way to get a sense of what the user likes. Does it like uh, lions, tigers, or bears? You might be figuring out where I got that from. Uh, sound of Music in case, or not Sound of Music, uh, Wizard of Oz, right? So we're gonna say st.radio, and we're gonna have a couple different things here. Unlike 
our options up here, the checkbox, the checkbox was a Boolean, right? So it was either true or false. The, the checkbox was either checked or it was unchecked. With a radio button, you're trying to take in a few different options that's going to allow for you to just to return one. So let's take a look at that in practice. The first thing we need to say is uh, kind of what animal do you like is your favorite. So that's our first thing. That's going to be our, our essentially our label. So what animal is your favorite? Uh, and now we're going to pass in a tuple. And this tuple is going to be the different radio buttons that the user can select. So we're going to say lions. Again, this is a tuple. So we have to separate everything out by commas, tigers, or bears. Don't put the or in there. It's going to be obvious in the app. Let's go ahead and rerun that. Now what we have, as you might have already seen, are a few different things. You can select lions, tigers, or bears. Again, nothing is happening. We can use that data, if animal, uh, to create another button. Let's call this button three. And that's going to be equal to st.button. We're going to call this submit, submit animal. Animal. I didn't spell that right. Animal. There we go. And what we can do is we can say if button three three, you might be already getting the syntax down and seeing how it works. Uh, if button three, so if button three is going to be clicked, we want to say st.write animal. So let's go ahead and rerun this. So submit animal and lions. Oh, that should probably be lion. Uh, so we can submit tiger there and uh, bears there. Again, bears, let's make bear plural or singular. Uh, so lion, tiger, or bear. Now what we can do is we can click that button and we see the output come out down here. Again, we can control that input data and use a whole bunch of different conditionals. So if it's a lion, maybe you just want to say, uh, give it a little something extra. So if uh, animal is equal to lion, then then we needed to say, uh, let's say st.write roar. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, so we're going to run that and you get that. Uh, now, if we select tiger and we run it, we don't get roar. We get nothing. Uh, lion gives us that roar because we've used that input to create some kind of a condition. So that's how the radio button works. Again, this is useful now for not taking a user input, but controlling that input for a very specific question that can only be one of three different things. That's going to be very useful for uh, a user to just to kind of select one argument for a function that a button will call. So you might be already kind of seeing how that works now. So another way that a user can input data is through what we call an input box, right? So the way in which a user can kind of input some kind of data. But before we get to that, let's just look at one other way that we can kind of do something kind of like a radio button. I am going to go ahead and copy and paste all of this. Again, copying and pasting, never good in a Python script or any coding. Um, but we're going to just go ahead and do it because we can just make some quick corrections on the fly. We're going to say uh, the start of the select box section. And we're going to change this to select box. And we're going to call this animal2, so it's a different object. We're going to call that button4, and we're going to call that animal2, and that. And if we re save that and rerun it, we now have got a problem, button four equals st button, submit animal. And we have a very common error that you're going to see. And if you debug the error, you'll notice it's a duplicate widget ID. So this is a happy accident. Uh, it gives me a great time to uh, tell you kind of one of these things you have to do. And that is everything has to have a unique name. So we're gonna call this submit animal two. So it just has a unique name and we can rerun it and the error will go away. Well, we have the exact same kind of thing up here with the uh, the radio button, but instead of a radio button, it might be cleaner in your app to have a select box. So it has a drop down box that you can kind of select something from. And again, this is going to do the exact same thing uh, that we saw up above because I copied and pasted. If you select lion, it does roar. But let's go ahead now and jump on down to uh, something a little bit more complicated, right? Something that you might need to do, which is something like a multi select box. So sometimes it might be important to get multiple variables from your user, uh, meaning it's not going to be something like a radio button or a select box button, but rather it's going to be two things. So it's going to be something that's not either true or false or not just a single answer. So to do that, we use something called a multi-select option and, and streamlit. And we're going to do this the exact same way. Let's go ahead and make a new header 
we're going to call this the start of the multi uh, multi select section and let's go ahead and make our options and that's going to be the pythonic way to do this uh, with your multi select you're oftentimes going to call it options because these are going to be the uh, kind of multiple things that a user can select that might go into a function so multiple arguments into a function think of that being useful for this so I'm going to say st dot or not right sorry multi select and that's going to allow us to pass in a few different uh, a few different arguments here so let's go ahead and allow for a user to pick from a few different things uh, we're going to allow them to pick from uh, let's say what do we want them to pick uh, what's your favorite um, what animals do you like so we're going to ask them what animals do you like now in this case we're not asking them to pick their favorite we're asking them what animals do they like and so again we're going to pass in a tuple or a list or whatever you want and this is going to have a few different options uh, let's say lion tiger we're going to say bear Again, we'll stick with the classics. And let's go ahead and save this and rerun it. And we now notice that we've got this down here, this multi-select section. It's going to look very similar to our select box, except for one very important thing. When I click Lion, you'll notice I have the ability to add or remove it, or keep it or remove it. I can go through and I can select all of these options. That's going to be really useful. Why? because it stores a few different important pieces of information. To demonstrate this, let's go ahead and say uh, button five is gonna be equal to st.button, um, print animals. And we're gonna say if button five is selected, then we're gonna say st.write, and we're gonna write out, let's write out options. And so let's go ahead and rerun this. Let's presume, let's, let's, let's stick with just, uh, just lion. Can print that and you've got a list here right it tells you uh, essentially that zero corresponds to lion so it's telling us that the first thing that we selected was lion we can add to it we can say bear one is bear we can add to it again and say tiger so we can control not only the, the things that the user inputted but we can also understand the order in which they input them, which means that you can structure this very dynamically. You can say, what is the order of your favorite animals that you like out of this list? So you can actually have the user give you not only the selection that they like, but also the order in which they like them. That's a lot of really important data that you can be receiving from your user, again, very simply and very easily using the multi-select feature. Sometimes you're going to need to get from your user numerical data. This is going to be really useful when you're trying to deploy a machine learning model or trying to get a user to train one really quickly uh, with not a fine a lot of fine tuning on hyperparameters. But you might want to allow them to control the number of epochs that a model might train. It doesn't really matter. My point is sometimes you need to take in uh, numerical data from a user and sometimes it's really easy to get that data so that it's always returned as an integer you can use something called a slider so we're gonna call this new section do it right down here start of the slider section uh, kind of like baseball so let's go ahead and start the slider section so for the slider we're gonna just maybe not be too creative we're gonna say let's say epochs is gonna be equal to uh, epochs num it's going to be equal to uh, slider oh sorry st dot slider and this is going to take a few different arguments now much like before we're going to see that the the word that we need to use to uh, the label for the special button so we're going to say uh, epochs how many epochs many epochs an epoch is just an iteration of a model it doesn't really matter the, the next thing that we're going to pass is the start of the slider. So where do you want the, mo uh, the slider to start? Now, you never train for zero generations, so you probably want to start off with one. Now, you might want to give the user the ability to train all the way up to 100 different epochs. Set a limit. But a very common way in which the uh, the model can uh, we can the very common way in which you train a model is with starting off around 10 epochs. But let's look at this first and see what it looks like. So we've got a, a slider that starts at 1, like we told it to, and ends at 100, like we told it to. And you can slide it all the way up, and you quickly can take in a user's input data that is numerical. But what we can also do is we can give that user a default. We can say something like 10, which is a common way to start. And we can see that we start the slider automatically at 10. And that information can, again, 
Let's create button six here. And I'll go ahead and show you another trick that you can do. Instead of creating a button, then checking to see if it's there, we can say if button six, sorry, if st.button, and we're just gonna call this uh, a, a unique name, uh, slider button. If that's clicked, then uh, st.write epochs num. So we can rerun this and let's look at that, see that, and then hit the slider button and it tells us an integer and it's 27. So we can actually control uh, a create a button this way. We don't need to keep on referring to it again and again on our script. This might be an easier way for you to just kind of create a button in the condition itself. And this is again how we can use that button to trigger a simple write with a conditional. So that's how you can take in slider input data and write it out pretty quickly, all in Streamlit. Uh, Another thing that you might need to do though is oftentimes, especially if you're working with text analysis, you're going to need to take in a specific user text input. Now text input is personally the feature that I use a whole bunch because I worked primarily with text analysis and deploying natural language processing models. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this might look like. Again, we're gonna do a whole other thing here, start of the text input section and we're going to say um, text input, let's just call it that. Actually, no, we shouldn't do that. That'd be bad. Um, user text is going to be equal to st uh, text input. Now you see why that would have been bad. Um, text input. And we're going to just give this one label. It's going to say, um, what's your favorite movie. So in this scenario, we don't want to list off every movie. We don't want to list off hundreds of movies. We want the user just to tell us what's your favorite movie. And so we can use that information that they give us and then kind of automatically print it off for them. Again, we can use that information to do more robust things, but you'll, you'll see that in a later video. So we're going to say again, if st.button, and we're going to call it text button, uh, if that's pressed, then we want to st.write user text. So let's go ahead and run this. So now what we can do is we can say Forrest Gump is my favorite movie. Compress text button and it outputs Forrest Gump. Again, you oftentimes aren't going to just print off what the user says. This is just to demonstrate how these features work. You can use that now as another way to pass a keyword argument to a specific function once the button is pressed. So sometimes it might be good to just give the user automatically a, a, a way to understand how the, the widget for the technical term is supposed to be kind of given data. So we can say your favorite movie should be um, Star Wars. Ep4, let's call it Ep4 like that, wonderful. Uh, and what we can do is we can refresh it and you've automatically given them a pre-built in answer. This is like gonna be automatically populated when the app loads and you can run it and it'll automatically have that as the input, but the user can also change it. So we're gonna go back. Nope, it's not Star Wars episode four, it's Forrest Gump. So they can go in and still change it, but this gives them a default to kind of work with right out of the gate. Kind of like the way we saw this argument work up here. So that's how you can allow for the user to input a lot of data. Sometimes they need to input numerical data and a slider is just infeasible. So one of the things that we can do is we can do something similar to a text button, but instead of text, we can allow for the user to input numerical data. Why is this important? Because if we were to allow for users to input textual data in this field uh, and we were to hit, hit run, well, notice that this number one is a little different than this one. Uh, notice the syntax highlighting. This is being rendered as an int this is not being rendered as an end. This is being rendered as a, what we call a numerical string or text represented as a string. Now we could do something like this in our code. We can convert that to an integer and we can rerun it and you'll see that now it's rendering it as an integer, as a numerical data, not as a numerical string, which is very important to distinguish because um, it throws off a lot of things if you try to pass a number as a string. But we have another way to actually do this all in Streamlit, so we don't have to convert things to ints. We can say user num is equal to st dot, we're gonna say number input. So what's your favorite number? And again, they can uh, simply say if, uh, submit a button, so if st button, we're gonna say number button. So if they press that number button, then we can say st dot write, and we're not gonna convert this to an int. We're gonna say, 
uh, user num. And what that's going to allow us to do is let's go ahead and refresh this. It's going to allow us to have a few extra features so they can tick up right here. Notice that we had that refreshing state there. We can print off and we can see that we actually uh, get this. And to understand why that's happening there with the float uh, requires an understanding of how floating numbers work. Um, long story short, it's always going to be an indefinite 99, but that's beyond, uh, beyond the point here. Uh, so what we have here though is we've got a way to automatically give the users the ability to input number data. We can control a lot of features within this app, and again, I'll get into more of the complex features of Streamlit in a later video, and I'll provide a link in the description down below for kind of some of these different features and how you can kind of use them on your own. But one of the things that might be useful is just being able to display long blocks of text. So I'm going to go ahead and now copy over from the Streamlit documentation a long block of text that they've already kind of have on their site. So I'm going to paste it in right here and we're going to just clean up some of these um, text to analyze. I'm going to do that. There we are. Clean that up there. And this is again on their actual website. And this is a great feature if you're working with if you're working with uh, NLP in, uh, in a Streamlit app. So that looks good, uh, and we want to do st.write sentiment, run sentiment analysis. So in this scenario, you could actually run a function from this text area. Let's go ahead and hit rerun, and you're going to notice that we have uh, invalid syntax. Let's see, what did I do wrong? Uh, looks like I still have that there. There we go. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. Close that. Save it again. And we've got text to actually analyze. Now, this text can be manipulated. It can be changed. In other words, it allows for you to give the user the ability to copy and paste in a lot of raw text that you can then run a function on. Now, this function is a dummy function. We don't actually have anything here, but we can create one. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's call this run sentiment analysis. So I'm not going to actually uh, do anything with this app. Uh, it's just going to simply say st.write. Um, let's just have it write um, analysis done. All right, so we'll save that, run this. And now what we have is uh, something that can be triggered, right? So we can run this app, and we can change all of this, rerun it again, and it'll always tell us analysis done. But what's useful here is that we can change it, we can pass in, uh, so maybe a keyword argument here, we can say that, and we can say, um, let's have it say text. Just print everything off again. Let's go ahead and rerun. And it'll change all of that for us. So you can see the function actually running now from this app. We can rerun that. Control enter to apply. And it completely re-alters the, the text that's being outputted here. So this is one of the ways that we can take in an input and return it with a function using the text area. So these are some of the uh, the features of Streamlit that uh, really kind of demonstrate real quickly how to get user input data really, really quickly. Now, these are going to be mainly the things that we work with in this video series. We're going to be also exploring some of the more uh, advanced features of Streamlit, specifically for uploading files, uh, altering your layout, and a bunch of other things. But hopefully this video has encouraged you to at least pursue and consider Streamlit for your app development. If you like this video, please like and subscribe down below and continue on watching with the next few videos in this series. There's probably going to be about 10 or 15 or so as we go through and explore more of the advanced features of Streamlit and specifically start designing apps to do specific things. If you are watching this series in July of 2021 or August of 2021 while I'm doing it, please do let me know in the comments if there's a specific app that you'd like to see developed on this channel, and I might add it into the series and do a specific development around your specific use case. Again, thank you for listening. If you've liked it, please like and subscribe down below, and please do consider supporting the channel via Patreon.